Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, that was a great song. I was jamming. I um, hope everyone is doing well today. Um, this is the CCPH Lunch and Learn event on community advisory boards, building and sustaining community-led infrastructure. We have simultaneous ASL and Spanish interpretation today. So before we begin, I'm going to pass it on to our Spanish interpreter for instructions on setting up your language preferences for today. Thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea, and I am here with my co-interpreter, Annabelle. And we ask for everyone to choose a language preference, um, in this case, English, just in case anybody participates in Spanish, you will be able to hear the voice of the interpreter in the English channel. So to make a selection um, of the English channel, please go ahead and click on the globe icon that says interpretation. It should be at the bottom of the screen on your computer. Then um, click there, then select English and do not mute original audio so that you're able to hear everything that's happening in the main room. Um, if you're joining through a tablet or your phone, a smart device, just tap lightly on the screen to bring up the three dot menu that says more, then select interpretation, then English. Again, don't mute original audio and then tap done to activate your selection. And I will give the same message in Spanish. Hola, bienvenidos a todos y a todas, a todos. Eh, estaremos presentando interpretación simultánea al español. Desde su computadora eh, puede ver el icono de globo terráqueo que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Por favor, seleccione allí. Después, español. Si usted solamente desea escuchar la voz del intérprete, puede silenciar el audio original. Y si está uniéndose a través de una computa de, a través de un dispositivo inteligente como tableta o teléfono, puede tocar la pantalla ligeramente para ver el menú de tres puntos que dice más, después interpretación, después español y puede activar su selección con listo o done. Okay, and for the speakers and everyone presenting, we just ask that you take your time with speaking, uh, take a breath here and there so that interpreters can always be at the same pace that you're going to. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to Emily. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome again, everyone. I'm Emily Finley, Engagement Lead for Community Campus Partnerships for Health, or CCPH. Thank you for attending our Lunch and Learn event today on Community Advisory Boards, Building and Sustaining Community-Led Infrastructure. We have a really exciting panel of speakers um, today to share their insights with you. I'm very excited. Um, so next slide, please. First, I want to introduce CCPH. You can see um, some of our really lovely uh, staff members here. Um, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary, and our mission is to promote health equity and social justice through partnerships between communities and academic institutions. Uh, we operate remotely with staff based all over the country. Uh, next slide, please. Our strategic pillars are the leading activities we engage in to promote health equity, leading, convening, disseminating, partnering, and training. Uh, CCPH is currently a partner on several large-scale federally funded research initiatives, um, including RADx UP, uh, the Recover Project, the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, and all of us, among other projects. Um, next slide, please. So you can take a moment. We'd like to do a quick poll with our audience to find out which aspect of community and 
advisory boards you're most interested um, in learning about today. Um, so we have recruiting members, budget design, establishing structures and processes, evaluation, sustainability, or if there's something else, uh, you can feel free to put that in the chat. Um, we just wanna get a sense of um, where our audience is today and what you're, you're interested in learning about. Um, great, so I'm seeing those poll responses coming in. So it looks like, um, it looks like 41. If Ken send it. Oh, it looks like 44% um, have said establishing structures and processes. Um, so maybe that's something we'll want to focus on um, in our panel discussion today. Also some interest in evaluation and sustainability um, and recruiting members. Great. So I'm going to end that poll. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so next slide, please. We'll do a quick icebreaker in the chat. Um, please consider sharing your name and the pronouns you use and the community groups that you work with or, or interact with. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat, um, Interested in learning how to bring a cab to a close? Yep, also a very important topic. Um, yeah, so if anyone wants to share in the chat your name, um, your pronouns, your organization. Um, I see someone uh, works with the geriatric community, um, older adults. Wonderful, uh, next slide please. You can keep that going. Um, so we have three main learning outcomes for today's session. And those are going to be to describe community advisory boards and their roles in community-based participatory research, um, to outline key considerations for forming and sustaining a CAB, and to list some examples of CAB creation guidance and evaluation in practice settings. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first, we just want to do some background, some grounding, get everyone on the same page. Um, so these are some definitions that I pulled from the literature. Um, about uh, community advisory boards. So this first bullet point um, tells us who community advisory board um, members are, and they share an identity, geography, history, language, culture, or other characteristic or experience, um, and convene to contribute community voice uh, to an initiative, program, policy, or project. Um, and community advisory boards also provide an infrastructure for community members to voice concerns and priorities that otherwise might not enter into the researcher's agenda and advise about suitable research processes that are respectful of and acceptable to the community. Um, so in a nutshell, community advisory boards can be a really important mechanism for um, promoting trust and reciprocity um, between researchers and communities and making sure that the research is really addressing those key community needs. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as always, we ground all of our lunch and learn event discussions in um, community-based participatory research, um, which is really a gold standard that we strive towards. Um, and CBPR is a collaborative research approach designed to ensure and establish structures for participation by communities affected by the issue being studied, uh, representatives of organizations and researchers in all aspects 
of the process. So this is an approach to community engaged research um, that seeks to um, promote power sharing uh, between all of the partners involved. Um, and so we're going to be discussing CABS kind of in that, in that context. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a variety of roles that a CAB can play um, in the research. And, um, and this is a non-exhaustive list, but um, members of a CAB can really be involved um, at all stages of the research process, you know, from the start identifying what are community priorities, needs, and interests. Um, helping to develop and refine the research questions um, that are going to drive a, a research study or project, um, advise on the study design and approach. Um, they can help identify um, recruitment strategies and venues um, that would be best for, you know, reaching um, the folks that you want to reach, um, provide resources um, and input for the interventions, activities, and programs um, that, are, that are being implemented. Um, they can help to interpret and disseminate uh, data and findings um, from research initiatives, um, and ultimately promote community investment um, in the research process. Um, so these are um, all different roles that, that um, CABs can be brought into. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are a lot of different types of community members who can serve on CABs. Um, ideally, your advisory board will reflect the diversity of communities served. Um, and you also wanna think about strategically recruiting members who align with the roles and the goals um, of the advisory board. So traditionally, um, a lot of advisory boards have included patient representatives. Um, so people who are affected by specific um, conditions or diseases who give input um, you know, to medical researchers, but they can also include um, community advisory board leaders uh, cultural or linguistic liaisons, um, particularly in uh, projects that are working with um, immigrant or refugee populations, um, faith-based leaders can be involved, um, professional or technical experts, um, and finally, lived experience experts. Um, and that can be in a variety of, <coughs> excuse me, of areas. I'm gonna take a sip of water. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So this just shows um, a couple key considerations um, when you are forming your cab. Um, so the first kind of bullet here, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I have something in my throat. I'm not crying because I'm sad about community advisory boards. I just have something in my throat. You'll have to pardon me. Um, okay. So there are a number of questions that you'll want to work through with your project team and partners when you're forming your community advisory boards. Um, so first and foremost, how can a cab help improve the project's quality and impact? Um, so this idea of assessing the appropriateness of a cab for your project, as well as the readiness of your team to support it. Um, and then secondly, are there clearly defined goals, expectations, roles, and scope of work? Um, many of the specific details of your cab functioning will emerge from members themselves once they convene, but there should be some specificity in goals beyond simply getting community input. Um, 
but something more specific beyond that. And, um, you know, in community engaged research, um, we emphasize involving community members as leaders. Um, so ideally, your board will have functions beyond sort of passively reviewing um, what the researchers are doing, um, but will have more of an active leadership role. Um, so third, does the project have the staffing and budget needed to support CAB formation and implementation. Um, this is really important. Um, securing funding and resources ahead of time is really critical to sustaining a board in the long run. Um, things you might include in a budget plan are staff members dedicated to CAB administration and communications, uh, stipends for your CAB members, budgets for food, transportation, and childcare, depending on the member's needs, budget for space rentals and materials, um, and do your CAB members need computers or other special equipment um, in order to uh, do the work? Um, and finally, how will the project team ensure the CAB represents the broader community? So it's important to make sure that there's alignment between your membership um, and the communities of interest uh, for your project. Um, and this is a question that you may continually revisit as your project aims change and evolve. Um, especially when existing cabs are repurposed for new projects, um, you might think about do any new members uh, need to be brought in? Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows some key questions for consideration around operating and maintaining your community advisory board. Um, so have the CAB members agreed upon procedures, bylaws, and decision-making processes? Um, in other words, how will your CAB run? Um, these decisions should be reached with direct input and discussion from CAB members themselves uh, to make sure that it is uh, accessible and appropriate. Um, you know, and then following up from that, are the CAB meeting times and location accessible and acceptable? Um, working out these external logistics early on um, is really important to gaining buy-in and promoting sustainability. Um, and it's recommended to have a regular process for checking in with your members around accessibility issues. Um, and then next, is there a clear process for incorporating CAB feedback and recommendations into the research? Uh, this is a question that really gets to uh, transparency and accountability between the research team and the CAB um, and the advisory board to make sure that um, voices really are being heard and are being um, implemented and integrated um, into the research activities. Um, and then finally, thinking about what activities can contribute to trust building between the project team, the advisory board, and the community. Um, and I might also add what activities can contribute to reciprocity and return of value to community members. Um, this goes somewhat beyond paying stipends to CAB members and really gets to the heart of understanding how the project and the work with the CAB members are impacting the communities um, that you serve. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please, and have a chat storm. I would love to hear from you about how you could utilize a CAB in your work, or if you already are working with a community advisory board, um, Give us some examples of how you're working with them. I would love to hear that. So I'm looking through um, some of these messages from the chat. Oh, I see a great um, some great questions here from Emily Anderson. Thank you um, that we can consider for our panelists. How do you motivate compensated CAB members to do more than just participate as passive reviewers? Oh, really good question. 
we tried to provide leadership opportunities, resources, clear goals, um, but after years of trying, couldn't seem to find CAB members who were interested in doing more than passively showing up and providing opinions at meetings. Okay, that, that's a really great question um, that I would love to um, throw over to our, um, our panelists. Um, and I see a hand up from William Coleman. Did you wanna share? Hi everybody, my name Hello. is William. Hello, but you can call me Billy. I am the uh, founder of the North Chicago Think Tank, and we operate um, in and around North Chicago, Waukegan, and Zion. And we have been working very closely through the Community Health Improvement Plan, as well as the Lake County Black and Brown Health Equity Coalition to try to stimulate engagement through um, boards that are pretty much made up of community members. And what we found when you talk about hesitation, um, we found that unless you have tools to help build the competency in community members, sometimes they don't have what it takes to engage in space. So for example, we found that some community members didn't know how to use Zoom versus Microsoft Teams versus um, other tools, or some uh, community members were very overwhelmed when they were hit with uh, tons of email. They're not used to engaging in that way. And so what we found is that we had to create a spectrum of engagement and that spectrum of engagement had to go through like, what happens if someone comes one time? What happens if someone comes a second, third time, fourth time? What tools do they need? And is there some sort of training and development piece that needs to be put in, in order to get them comfortable to even be in that space? We also found, um, we started integrating a uh, response tool called Minty, which I'm sure some of you may be familiar with, but it allows people to give their feedback without saying it right at that moment. So I could be doing a presentation and then a QR code will come up and they can from their phone oh, give their feedback, but it's anonymous. And so it just, we use like word clouds and rating systems so that they don't have to feel like their identity mm -hmm. is attached um, to their response because sometimes that can be um, overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that we had to implement was pace of progress. Um, to help community members understand that depending on your level of power, access to resources, or decision making, some things can go fast, some things can go slow, right? And so we had to introduce pace of progress so that community members who may be at a place where things are urgent could understand really the flow of how things were going to go. Because before we did that, we just saw community members just get very frustrated because they just wanted to see things change, you know, because they're in the heat of it. They know the, the urgency. Um, and so that was a bit difficult. And we just had our first ever design day where we brought in 37 community members and we paired them with resource managers and program managers. And we gave them food, we paid them livable wage, and then we broke out into, um, work groups to just uh, talk about possible solutions from their perspective around um, health equity, food security, job security, housing. And they came up with 61 really great solutions. And that was just a one-time experience. And so I think when you talk about creating these boards, sometimes they're not going to stay the whole time. And so you have to design it so that if you can get a community member in one or two times, that you can get the benefit, they can get the benefit, and it can drive, you know, uh, progress in in your initiatives. Yeah. Well, thank you, Billy. Thank you for sharing um, some really great insights there. I love the um, spectrum of engagement concept. Oh. Just reminding people to please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, that was some really wonderful tips in there. Um, and I'm also seeing some other questions uh, in the chat. Um, how do we distinguish between a CAB and a community consultation board? Um, that might be something different. Um, what competencies do academic researchers need to develop to effectively and respectfully engage uh, with 
the calves. Uh, also, really great question. So um, thank you, everyone, for um, this engagement. Um, let's go to the next slide and get our panelists in here um, to, to dig into some of these questions. Um, so today I'm excited to introduce our two panelists, uh, Renesia Kennedy and Dr. Carrie Revens. Um, Renesia Kennedy is the Senior Community Engagement Coordinator at University of Pittsburgh Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, or CTSI. Uh, CTSI bridges the gap between researchers and the community by partnering with diverse community members and organizations to build on community strength and learn about health topics. Um, she's also a community leader in her hometown of Duquesne, Pennsylvania. Um, and Dr. Carrie Revens is a community health researcher with expertise in Latino immigrant health and community-based participatory research. Dr. Revens is a research professor at UNC Charlotte and the founder and director of Camino Research Institute, um, overseeing quantitative and qualitative research projects uh, with Latino immigrants using CBPR. Um, so thank you so much uh, to both of you for joining us today. Um, to get started, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the community advisory boards that you work on um, and some of the, the roles um, and goals of those uh, boards? Who wants to go first? Carrie, do you wanna go first? I can go first. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Emily. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. So a little bit about the advisory boards that we have here at CTSI. Uh, they're community advisory boards where we engage with them quarterly. Um, and then with, you know, through that quarterly engagement, uh, whenever we do engage, we present kind of updates on what programs we have going on. We give them updates on what grants we have going on. Um, and then not only that, it's a place where it's bi-directional communication that that's happening, right? Uh, so we also provide spaces and places for them to be able to give us feedback on what's going on in their communities and their organizations. Um, and with you know us only meeting four times a year, we are trying to make sure that we are supporting in the interim um, and so we're attending these different community events that they're having, uh, and we are just, you know, showing up, um, and then our community advisory boards, um, we ask them to be, you know, grant reviewers, uh, community partners on research studies. Mm -hmm. um, we ask them to also uh, attend our really big meetings with the NIH, which is really important and just showing just transparency, uh, providing trainings, uh, doing uh, human-centered design work, um, and just, you know, just continuously revising and um, evolving our, our processes. It's, it's kind of what, what we do with our community advisory board. We share everything, um, not to a fault, like we, we say, here's what's going well and here's what's not going well. Uh, and so I think that, hope I hope that answers your, your question, but I think that's mostly what we do with our community advisory board. Thank you, Renesha. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I work mostly with um, Latino immigrants through our community advisory board. So I work, I'm embedded a, at a research institute that's embedded within a nonprofit that mostly serves um, Latino immigrant families in the greater Charlotte region of North Carolina. Um, so some of the families that we're helping are brand new to the U.S. and then others have been here for, you know, 10 or 15 years, but they're seeking a variety of different help services to help get them on their feet when they when they arrive here. Um, so we form different community advisory boards for every research project that we're doing. Um, and a lot of the role that they play is that they're the experts on exact everything that's happening, the issue at hand in either their neighborhood or what, however we're defining community for that particular project. And they are involved in all aspects of the research project from helping us think through what the questions are to how we're collecting the data, um, the translation of things from English to Spanish and going across multiple different dialects of Spanish. 
Um, they're helping us actually recruit and collect data. Um, and they are helping even with analysis, dissemination. And then at the end of all of that also, now what are we gonna do with this data? And how can we use these findings? And what does this mean for you and for your family and for your community? Um, so we really engage with them at multiple different levels. And we have a variety of different countries of origin present and people from multiple different backgrounds with different lived experiences, depending on what the topic is at hand, um, so that they can all contribute in different ways with their knowledge and their skills. We engage um, with them regularly once a month, but also throughout that, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication, either by text or by phone, um, but we meet with different advisory boards once a month, and it's usually virtual um, because we also do a lot of work across the state. So we have um, advisory board members who are in other parts of North Carolina, um, but we stay in constant communication with them we have a variety of staff on our team and each of them are like assigned to be sort of the lead of the advisory board. So they have a very specific point of contact. Um, but, you know, similar to what has already been said is we engage by going out to where they are. We go to their activities, community events with them. We recruit for studies together. Um, we do all of those kind of things to where we're not just asking them for their input every now and then when when we feel like we need it we're letting we're inviting them in to be a part of the whole thing and we're coming alongside them engaging with their community getting to know who they are getting to know their families connecting on a personal level um and so that's just a little bit about kind of who our community advisory boards are and and what they do thank you um, so I had some prepared questions, but we're, I'm seeing a lot of really great questions in the chat. Um, so I actually want to get into um, some of these questions from our audience members. Um, so this question from uh, Emily Anderson, how do you motivate compensated CAB members to do more than just participate as passive reviewers? Um, and there was a follow up to that um, I think, let me see, um, to hear about what kinds of trainings or development opportunities you might offer um, or just other strategies for, for keeping CAB members engaged um, sort of beyond just that, that passive level. And uh, that can be either of you. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you answer this one first. Okay. Well, um, I loved what um, what Billy said earlier when he kind of spoke up and was talking about like the continuum of engagement. We do something similar, but I've never um, used that term, but I love that. But that's spot on. But trying to give um, different opportunities depending on what level they can engage, engage at. But one thing that we do is try to give them some sort of like skills assessment or strengths assessment at the beginning to see what it is, what skills they already have, what things are they passionate about, what role would they like to play and kind of try to match them up with something that's going to help meet those needs and help them feel more fulfilled. And then at the same time, also finding out what would you like to learn more about? What skill would you like to have more of? Some people are interested in they're, they they like to connect with people. And so they just, they want to help recruit. They want to go out to a community event, talk to people about a, a project or a survey, ask them to take it. They like to motivate and tell them, you know, this is why this matters. We want your voice to be heard. We're going to use this data for X, Y, Z. Um, other people want to be more behind the scenes and maybe help look at some of the, the data or, you know, there's a lot of different levels that people want to engage in. So we try and do these assessments to figure out where they're at when they come to us. And then we do offer different supports and trainings throughout. And we are fortunate that we are part of a, a nonprofit, that we have some upward mobility services that includes like some computer skills trainings um, and different things like that, where we can help people along the way. Um, but we also put them through like a more formal community-based CBPR, community-based participatory research training that uh, when they come out of it, they can become a community researcher. Um, mm -hmm. But it's difficult to keep, keep people engaged for a long time, even if they are compensated. So I think helping them find something they're truly passionate about and enjoy doing 
or also if there are people who aren't employed and they're looking for employment and this is a pathway to employment for them. Um, because for us, some of the people that we engage with that couldn't commit as much or were just more of those passive participators were actually some community leaders who um, were so engaged in so many other things and busy in so many other things that we were trying to look and ask them to nominate other people that may have more time to dedicate or, you know, may really be interested in research or something, uh, you know, community health or something like that. Um, so I think that that personal fulfillment connection is important. And then we really try to just develop those personal connections with them. We ask them about their family. We know who they are. Um, you know, I said that I mostly work with Latino immigrants and it's all about personalismo and familismo, like personal connections, family relationships and connections. And so I think that helps us. Uh, it goes a long way with buy-in from people. They want to engage with us because we become friends. We become, you know, we care about one another. So I hope that helps answer yeah. the question a little bit. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I do love that you... Um, you know, set up your cab members with those like tangible skills trainings um, to, you know, um, as community researchers. So that gives them, you know, something tangible that even if they leave the cab, you know, they can take with them, you know, to a future career um, or or something like that is really um, wonderful. Um, Renesha, did you have thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add with what Billy and Carrie uh, mentioned and then talk a little bit about like some of the programs that we have that we offer our CAB members. Um, so one thing I, I, I would like to really put out there is um, it's really important to level the playing fields whenever you're working in community, right? Because a lot of times when we bring communities together and we have folks with doctor's degrees and all these long lists of um certifications and, and degrees that it's really important to empower the community to help them to understand that we are all just people with different lived experiences um, and that we should really just level the playing field. So one of our programs uh, that we offer here at CTSI is our Community Partners Research Ethics Training, which allows for community members to be a community partner. So kind of be a co-PI. They can help with, you know, recruitment. They can help with uh, writing. They can help with data analysis. Um, and, and what the city training um, excuse me, what the CPRET training does is if you are familiar with the city trainings that you have to do, um, it centers the community, right? Because city trainings, if you've done them, I'm going to say this, I think they're boring and it's hard for us to get through. And we actually went to school for some of these things, right? But actually asking a community member to be a part of a research study, using all this research jargon um, could, could set up more of a barrier for community members, right? And so CPRET is a slide deck that we provide uh, that researchers could use to tailor their ethical examples of here are some good ethic examples and here are some bad ethic examples, right? Uh, particularly pertaining to the research study that they would be a community partner on. Um, and so it breaks down research from like the rudimentary level to all the way, you know, the actual research study that they're actually going to be working on. Uh, and again, community members and our community advisory board is just always so grateful um, to just learn some of the terminology. I mean, education is everything. Um, and that is something that I would like uh, to, for, for you all to take away today is educating the community on the in the places and spaces um, that they are not aware of. And don't assume that people know. Um, just be very mindful of the language uh, that we use. Try to be inclusive and include photos and videos because everyone learns differently. Um, and so, but Secret is one of those programs that I'm just extremely um really grateful for because within that we also help with like um, making sure that the research teams are setting up like equitable compensation right and what that looks like a uh, minimum of $25 an hour depending on what you're asking right we help researchers set up contracts and there's so many other opportunities that you know you kind of plant the seed uh, with 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 um 
programs like like CPRA. And then lastly, uh, the second program I would just kind of want to highlight are community engagement studios. And I like to look at those as kind of like a soft introduction uh, between a research team and community members. And community engagement studios allows for community members' lived experience to really be highlighted. And we look at the community as the expert. So I say always um, just put in the community members in a space of you are an expert as well. It's not just us, just because we are a part of these larger institutions. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind all of us um, to pace our speaking um, so that our, our interpreters um, can keep up. Um, so let me, there was another great question um, from an audience person from uh, Dana Watnick, what competencies do academic researchers need to develop to effectively and respectfully engage with CABS? Um, Carrie, did you wanna uh, take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, honestly, I think a lot of it is just about listening um, and actually being, um, being able to recognize the power balance and the power differential and the skills and the background that you have as a researcher that um, the community members also have their own knowledge, their own experiences, their own skill sets that they're bringing to the table. So I don't know if I'm answering this exactly as, as what you guys were looking for when you asked the question in the chat, but from what I've learned along the way, um, and I've been doing this for almost 10 years now with community-based participatory research and being an outsider to the community that I work with, is a lot of it is just about listening, being transparent, being, being humble, being willing to learn. Um, and I think the transparency part is so, so important. And that was mentioned earlier about talking about what works well and what doesn't work well. I think it also is about owning mistakes because we're all going to make mistakes. We're human. So if you make a mistake or you do something that ended up being offensive or, and you didn't mean for it to, whatever that mistake might look like when you're working with uh, a community who's that's different from your own or a culture that's different from your own is being able to own that um, and being able to apologize for that um, and just showing up to say, hey, I'm here. I'm re I, I want to learn as much as I can about your community. Um, you know, I want to work alongside you to come up with some solutions to the issues that you that are most important to you. I'm an ally, you know, and I'm here to help. And I think over time, those are actually some skills and they have a lot to do with your, you know, some of your personal skill set and your emotional intelligence and some of those kind of things that I think are really important and are always things that um, that we can work on. And then at the same time, just taking a lot of time to understand the culture and the community of those that you're working with through some cultural competency training, some cultural humility trainings, um, that where you can really have a more in-depth understanding, engaging with that community and what we would call in qualitative research, like prolonged engagement is also a way to do some of those learnings um, and understanding is just being present, showing up. When I was first starting to work with a Latino immigrant community, I just showed up for every, every volunteer opportunity that I could to show that I was there, I cared and you know I wanna get to know you um, and so some of those are are very achievable ways to start connecting with your community and your community advisory board members. Yeah, and if I could just build on that, um, you mentioned, Emily, uh, reciprocity, and that is something that we, uh, particularly here at CTSI, make sure we embed in every aspect of any type of guidance that we're providing research teams. Um, we talk about what, like, what are the guiding principles of, of reciprocity, which is like empathy, equity, honesty, respect, transparency, bi-directional communication, value exchange. Uh, Carrie just, just talked about that. What is that value exchange? Are you showing up for the community like you want us to show, like, like you want them to show up for your research study, right? And what that looks like is sometimes actually partaking in community events 
that has nothing to do with research, right? There may be a Wednesday where there's like a game night or a family night or something where you go participate just to, you know, engage with the community, really focus on community engagement, not recruitment. A lot of times we uh, confuse the two um, because can, with really great community engagement can come really great recruitment. However, it's really important to get to know the community and not only get to know the community, but make yourself a little bit vulnerable um, and say, here's why I'm here. You know, remind the community of what your passions and how you landed here. Um, I don't know about you all, but typically whenever I invite folks to my house, uh, they don't come in to my house, and open my refrigerator, cook me dinner. Like, no, it's usually... I host them, right? And so it's really important for us to understand that we have to build trust in the community. Um, and as the way we build trust is just by by showing up and acknowledging the history, um, uh, acknowledging some of the bad things that have happened in research, like Tuskegee, um, uh, Henrietta Lacks, like there's so many things that has happened in the past and it's okay to apologize and say, hey, I'm sorry about that experience. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is move from that, right? We're trying to evolve and we'll try to do with research with the community and not on the community, so. Great, thank you. I love that, doing research with the community, not on the community, um, is a great point. And also making that distinction between engagement and recruiting for research um, are two very different activities. Uh, so let me see, um, we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I'm looking at some comments in the chat. I'm wondering um, in terms of uh, evaluation and sustainability, how do you evaluate your cab? How do you know uh, when you're doing a good job um, or you know, when you need to make an adjustment uh, to something? Um, can you... Give us some insights into sort of how you do that evaluation and assessment. Uh, Dr. Revens? Yeah, um, so I'll give an example from uh, the county that we're in, Mecklenburg County. We had a community advisory board for our uh, strengths and needs assessment project where we were trying to collect data to help better understand what are the most prominent community issues, but also what are the strengths and how we can use the strengths to help um, overcome some of the barriers so um, we, with our Mecklenburg County Community Advisory Board, so we basically just asked them directly through some surveys, but also through some one-on-one, -on -one, you know, more informal interviews to get their feedback on what the experience was like. What did we do well? What did we not do well? Um, how can we improve? Um, those are some of the things that we did that would, then we would take their, their feedback and kind of help mold the next community advisory board that we were going to be working on. But Asking them directly is really the best way to know how you're doing. And you've established those relationships of trust by that point. And so you hopefully, you know, that they're going to share that honest feedback with you because as we've talked about already, the transparency, the reciprocity and all of those things. So I think keeping those lines of communication open, the personal relationship too of the staff member here with the cab member checking in on them and kind of seeing how things are going. They can also just ask them, you know, one on one kind of along the way um, and then show them that you're actually listening and you're um, hearing their feedback and incorporating it. Great. Thank you. Um, Renesha, any final um, comments or insight into your cab evaluation? Yeah, so uh, Carrie hit on it right on the news. Uh, we also just ask, uh, we do human-centered design approaches to some of our programming. Uh, we show marketing materials. We want honest feedback. And then not only do we ask for feedback, we also make sure we follow up. So we, you know, the information that they give us, like here are the things that we think you need to change. We also say after a couple of weeks, maybe two weeks or so, Here's how, here are the minutes from our meeting. And not only that, here's the product that we were able to produce. Um, because a lot of times, even just like in research, uh, what happens is dissemination gets lost, right? Um, because the research process may be a lot longer than your relationship, you know, but it's really important to make sure that you're disseminating some of that information back. Um, 
And then also uh, in regards to sustainability, even though we, you know, we, we pay our CAB members, uh, you know, quarterly, every time they attend the meeting, we also create opportunities for them to still be compensated through the times that we are not engaging, um, which is just really important. Um, and just meeting community where they're at. Uh, and just like I said, um, never have an expectation of your CAB members just because they're a part of your uh, advisory board that they want to volunteer to do things because at the end of the day, we're all getting paid to do a job. Um, and we, you know, we want to make sure we are respecting folks' time. Um, and so I think that's just really important. Great. Thank you. Um, so this wraps up our panel. Um, I just want to thank you so much um, to Carrie Revens and Renesia Kennedy for um, your wonderful insights today. Um, and everyone in the chat um, who's been uh, following along and participating, um, thank you so much. Um, if you um, have any more questions, you can feel free to reach out um, to our CCPH email. Um, we are going to share the a copy of the slides and recording um, with our participants. And the slides also have um, some references of some additional resources for you. Um, for all of that information. Um, and we encourage you to explore CCPH's other training offerings. Uh, we offer virtual hybrid and in-person trainings to organizations and partnerships looking to increase community engagement to promote health equity. Um, so please go on our website to take a look at the trainings. Um, and finally, um, evaluation is very important to us. Um, and so please, um, if you could take a moment to um, complete the evaluation form, um, we should get a link to that. Yeah, the link is in the chat um, from Alan Wells. Um, so please um, take a moment now, um, if you could, to fill this out um, so that we can... Um, make our improvements for our future sessions. Um, just pause for a minute so that folks can do that now. Okay, thank you so much everyone uh, once more for attending today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists and to our interpreters. Um, please feel free to visit our website ccphealth.org and um, connect with us on social media um, and save the date for our future lunch and learn events. Our next event will be October 11th. We're going to be talking about managing project startup. Um, and then on November 8th, um, we will talk about managing project wrap up. So kind of a two parter um, there for you um, in the next couple months. So um, please, you know, share this with any colleagues or partners who you think would be interested. Um, and thank you again um, for your participation today.